You're listening to the best of the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. Thirty-nine volumes of the best of the bravest. Thirty-nine, which is crazy to think. It started a couple years ago, like I said, with Ray Seeley, and it's taken on a life of its own. It's one of the four mini series we have on this show. And each interview teaches me more and more about the New York City Fire Department. I have no doubt that tonight uh, will be no different. And welcome to this milestone episode 250 of the Mike the New Haven podcast. Like I said, volume 39 of the best and bravest. If you haven't checked out the previous one, retired NYPD Sergeant Dan Murphy, who was a veteran of places like the Joint Terrorism Task Force, of course, the Narcotics Task Force, as well as the Major Case Squad, whereas as a detective in 1995, he had a very notable kidnapping case and murder case. That he helped solve took him all the way to los angeles so really interesting guy and uh, that was a very interesting show of course you know the deal we have to run through our sponsors real quick and we're going to move through them very quickly super thanks of course if you're missing the show and you catch it later super chat as well if you have any questions tonight i'd appreciate it if you contribute there that best of the bravest intro was made by yours truly and if you didn't know by now i do have a consulting company need advice on how to start your podcast frustrated with the editing process can't find a voiceover guy hi I'm Mike Cologne, and I'm here to help. I'm the owner and founder of MC Media Editing Services, your premier consulting company for all things media, where I can offer you consulting advice on how to get started, and once you get started, editing, as well as voiceover work, all for a very reasonable price. If you want to reach me, you can contact me at 917-781-6189 or the email that you see listed here. I'm always available, and I'm always willing to help. Again, 917-781-6189. Why go to some giant consulting firm that's going to charge you an arm and a leg when you can just come to me? If you want to be stress-free, the way to go is to call MC. MC Media Editing Services, your premier consulting company. And business is picking up on that front, which is very exciting, and hopefully it can continue to. And, of course, that brings me to my next sponsor, the co-executive creator and producer of Tales from the Boom Room Profiles, the NYPD's arson explosion bomb squad. And that is Mr. Bill Ryan. The Mike the New Haven podcast is proudly sponsored and supported by the Ryan Investigative Group. If you need an elite PI, look no further than the elite Ryan Investigative Group, which is run by retired NYPD detective Bill Ryan, a 20-year veteran of the department who served the majority of his career in the detective bureau, most notably in the arson explosion squad. So if you need a PI to handle anything from fraud, legal services, and anything else that you might require, contact Bill at 347 417 1610 again 347 417 1610 reach him at his website or the email that you see here again if you need a pi look no further than bill ryan and the ryan investigative group a proud supporter and sponsor of the mike the new haven podcast good man billy and my next sponsor and the last sponsor of course but certainly not the least it's another good man and a big supporter of the show former nypd officer now criminal defense attorney mr joe murray if you're ever caught on the wrong end of the law call joe murray Joe's a retired NYPD police officer turned criminal defense attorney. With 15 years of experience in the NYPD from 1987 until 2002, he parlayed a successful career in the NYPD into an equally successful career as a criminal defense attorney. His website is jmurray-law.com, where you can reach him at 646-838-1702, or just email him at joe at jmurray-law.com. Always appreciate Joe's support. Okay, sponsorships taken care of. Now to the good stuff. My next guest is a man who spent 26 years as a member of the New York City Fire Department, sworn in during the spring of 1993. His career would see him work for a few ladder companies along the way, an engine company as well, as he'll talk about tonight as a fire officer, before becoming a charter member of the FDNY Special Operations Command. When it was revamped, it had already existed, as some guys have pointed out, but it was revamped to add squads to the mix in the summer of 1998. And he, of course, went to squad 288 for two stints, one as a firefighter in 1998 to 2002, and again, returning as a lieutenant in 2009 until his retirement in 2019. Seven year stint in between as a lieutenant in engine 29103 prior to Sheffield Avenue in Brooklyn. And that is my boss, one fifth of the Getting Salty Experience podcast. He's already laughing in the back room. Of course, I'm one of the fifths of the Getting Salty Experience podcast as well. Mr. Luber Frano, who joins us tonight, for the best of the bravest volume 39 lou I, I never met you before i don't think we met you got me mikey you got me baby i finally got you it took a while i bothered him in our group text and here he is tonight so most people know your origin story and it was a tough one in that you know you lost your father young i think you grew up in brooklyn so I, did you feel since again most of the audience is quite familiar with you did you feel you had to grow up quicker than most uh i think i mean i try and tell my kids now like 
growing up in the city in the 70s was tough. You know, you didn't leave your bike outside because it would get robbed. You know, you didn't walk around with your gold chain out because somebody would snatch it off you, right? Uh, I think I've told that story where I was on the subway and somebody reached in through the window and grabbed my chain through the window of the of the of the train and i grabbed up on, grabbed onto his arm and i wouldn't let go and then the train started to move and he was yelling and i was yelling and people were yelling and it was pretty crazy and uh he finally let go but i was that, that was my father's chain so uh you know there was no way i was letting somebody steal that chain you know so right but yeah it was tough the city was tough you know you're, you you grow up faster, you know. My kids now they take their money out at the you know at the mall, and I'm like, what are you doing? Put your money out. How much is it? It's two dollars. So you go like this. You take your two dollars and you give them the two dollars. You don't take your flash your money, right? But right, it's different times, and you know, you just learn faster then. I think. Yeah, no, it was taxi driver in New York, as I've said back then. It was very very chaotic. As any of the FD guys that have been on Salt here or this show have talked about working during that era, certainly the PD guys can attest to that. And the subway system was a mess. Times Square was it? You know, well, now Times Square is a little crappy, but, you know, even a couple of years ago, it was like Disney World. But yeah. when I grew up, not so much. Oh, my God. It was peep shows and hookers and all sorts of stuff. So it was mayhem, you know, so uh, garbage everywhere. So, yeah, no, it wasn't it, it wasn't until Giuliani came in and really cleaned up everything that right. Times Square started to in the city as a whole started to turn around. Now, of course, I and if I have this wrong, correct me. Was your father on the job or did you not have any prior family on the job? So I did not have anybody on the job. My father was sanitation. Okay. So uh, as it turned out, he got on the job. He was in the army uh, and then he, he uh, got on the job 1957 to 1977. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he passed away in April. That was the same summer. I remember, obviously, that was the blackout. Uh, yeah. That was the, the summer that Elvis Presley died. Because that was only like a couple months. I don't know what month it was. You probably remember this stuff, but uh, so it was, it was only, yeah. So it was only a few months after my father passed away, um, and he was in the process of retiring. He actually had his papers, and he it, at that time, I guess you could do twenty years, like the FDNY. Yeah, and uh, he had his papers in to retire, and uh, my uncle was sanitation. There was like I had like three, two uncles that were sanitation, and. Um, I guess they were able to get his paper because my mother would have got no money. You know, he, he was taking the maximum. So his papers were in. So uh, they made sure that, you know, she was able to uh, get some type of a pension considering he just, I mean, literally, he, he just had started to file the paperwork to retire. Wow. Yeah, and crazy stuff. If I remember correctly, your mother was really savvy with finances and that she passed on to you. So you learned about money real quick to where if not for the fire department, you could have easily been one of those guys on Wall Street. So, again, that's my uncle who my my mother's sister, her husband, um, he was involved with uh, Wall Street. And when my mother got whatever the money was at the time, I think it was about thirty thousand dollars. He helped her to invest in the stock market. Um, you know, it's companies, I still have some of those stocks, so, you know, she has passed away, but, uh, Exxon and GTE and all those companies that you would remember, AT&T, you know, mm -hmm. Ball Corp, all those companies. And at the time I remember going to get the paper because I think, you know, you, you don't have it on your phone back then. This was in late seventies. You actually had to go look it up in the paper what it closed at on a daily basis. So I remember helping my mother circle because she used to keep a book every month she used to keep what the stock was trading at and that's how i kind of started to get into that stock market uh uh you know involvement was through her checking her stocks to see you know that was pretty much all her money and uh so that's how i kind of got involved with that and it kind of just worked its way through i i, I went to uh, christ the king high school i was always really good in math and uh I kind of wanted to go into finance. I, I actually got a job with that that uncle who helped my mother, uh, that sister who was married to him, worked in, on Wall Street in Bankers Trust, 14 Wall Street. And mm -hmm. I used to take the M train, which was right near Christ the King. It was the last stop. I used to, after school, I would get on the M train. Could you imagine? <laughs> never let my daughter do that now, right? It's right. 16, 17. I used to take that to, to Wall Street, get off you know, right at uh, Trinity Church, walk down a block to, you know, 14 Wall Street Bankers Trust. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times. And uh, I would work three hours there, 
and then get back on the train and come home. And, uh, you know, that's how I, the ball started to roll. And I seen guys who were making a lot of money, stockbrokers. You just, I was right, right across the street from the stock exchange. So that, that bug was definitely, uh, you know, the seed was planted and, uh, you know, I definitely got involved cause I just, you know, I wanted to do well, you know what I mean? I saw these guys making money. They were young, you know, young, like me, 20, you know, they were making a lot of, and this was in the eighties. This is the Reaganomics era. Yeah. Oh, this was, you know, early to mid eighties. I went to high school from 82 to 86. I graduated in 86. So, you know, 80, you know, the, the, I was actually by 86, by 87, I think that's the crash was in 87 or 89, yep, 87, 89, 87. Uh, 80, 87. Yep. October 87, 87. Right. So yeah. I was already a stockbroker by that time, even though I was going to Baruch College. Uh, I started going to Baruch College on, um, uh, you know, on in the mornings. And then when I got this job on Wall Street, uh, I started going at night, you know, because I, I took the Series 7. I passed it the first time, which is very, very tough. And uh, I started trading stocks. You had to call people up like, you know, well, everything you've ever seen, boiler room. Not it wasn't like that because this was an older company. Uh, but you had to call people. And you know, that's again, it's a lot of no's to get to a yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like going to the club, Mike. When you get the girls, you know, you gotta <laughs> you gotta go through a lot of no's to get to the yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. And, and back then, I mean, listen, there was ebbs and flows, as there is now, but there were so many ebbs and flows to the economy. There was the Cold War threat, there was the fear of what was gonna happen with the Russians. Oh, you yeah, didn't yeah, know yeah, how yeah. that was gonna explode. And then you do get a wartime economy for a brief time with the Gulf War in the early nineties. How did that affect anything on Wall Street? So by that time, I started eighty seven. Um, I mean, I have a really interesting story. I was thinking about this today when, you know, what stories was I going to tell that nobody hasn't heard? Uh, in that particular company, it was called Moore and Schley was the name of the company, like old line. They've been around for like 80 years, some ridiculous thing. And I probably had about at, at 80, 88, I was 20 years old. So mm -hmm. I probably had like $3 million under management from calling people up and saying, Hey, listen, you know, send me money. They would send me $10,000, 20,000, you know, and that over time you'd have two, $3 million under management, let's say. And I was working with a guy, um, who was really making a lot of money, like a lot of money. And, um, he said to me one day, he's like, Hey, listen, Lou, you can keep your own book, which is have your own clients. And, but I want you to work for me, like handle some of my, you know, my, my clients, my top clients. So I was like, this is a no brainer. I don't have to, you know, I'm kind of getting money from both ways, right? I could trade my own stocks with my own clients, but I'm working with him and he was going to pay me. So it was like every month you go to zero, right? It's not like a regular job where they pay you all the time. Every month you have to generate commission at the time. Uh, you start at zero every month. So uh, I started working with him. And he was making a lot of money. And I start, you know, realizing like what's going on and, you know, without getting into too many details, he's doing like what they call a short squeeze. So again, I don't remember all the specifics because I was young, but I remember like one day uh, he, he calls me up at home, which he never did. Uh, there was two guys. He calls me up at home and he's like, Lou, listen, uh, you've been loyal to me and everything, blah, blah, blah. He goes, whatever happens, and I have no idea what's what's coming. He's like, whatever happens, just tell the truth. So I'm like, what do you mean, Ben? What are you like? What are you talking about? He's like, whatever happens, you don't have. I'm t I'm going to be all right. Just tell them exactly what you did and exactly what you did. You know, uh, on a daily basis. Don't don't try and hide anything or do anything. I'm like, all right, no problem. The next morning, it was just was. So he must have got the word somehow. The next morning, it was just like in. What was the movie with uh, Wolf of Wall Greed? Street? No, Greed is Good with, uh, you know what I'm talking about? It was, uh, I'll think of it. Anyway. I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. Greed is Good. It was uh, with Michael Douglas. And uh, he, uh, the, all of a sudden the cops come in and it was just like that movie. Like they come in, they walk into his office and he stands up. And he turns around and they put the handcuffs on him. And it was no, no, I mean, it was not even, I'm not even kidding. It was like hilarious. And then, you know, they, he walks out and um, uh, I had a, I mean, I was still there and I still had my own book. And then they, you know, I, I had to jump through hoops with the uh, SEC mm -hmm. and, you know, all that stuff. But uh, as it turned out, he was doing, oh, it was the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, so, you know, it was, um, 
I had I had to change, so I ended up changing uh, firms. And um, you know, again, I went to a firm that I knew. You know, I knew a lot of guys now from from in on Wall Street. And I went to a firm called J.T. Moran, which was if you saw a Boiler Room, that yeah. was very similar to what I was doing there. I mean, it was very similar to Wolf of Wall Street, but um, that was with DiCaprio, right? Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf, yep. Wolf, yeah, he's yeah. Playing so Jordan Michael Bell Douglas. Ford. I forget the one Michael Douglas was in, but it's it's an older one. But it was very similar to that because that was an older version of the Wolf of Wall Street, an earlier version, right? So, but um, I just realized pretty pretty early that like I don't want to do this, you know. Uh, kind of like what was happening was when you when you get paid on commission, people do things for the wrong reason, right? They they make sales because when you make sales, you get paid. So right. I really knew that these guys were really forcing stuff down people's throats, kind of similar to the Wolf of Wall Street, kind of similar to, um, you know, Boiler Room and all of those things. So, you know, hanging out with Kevin my whole life, I mean, I never really was dreaming of being a fireman. I always thought my mother always told me to take those tests, sanitation and PD and um, and the fire department and you know, at the time I was making good money. I mean, you know, in the eighties I was doing, you know, 8,000 a month, 10,000 a month, you know, like, you know, for, I had season tickets to the Rangers when they won the cup, you know, for the night, you know, I had season tickets for years. So, you know, 10,000 a month for at the time in the eighties was probably like, you know, 30,000 now. And, um, I was doing okay, but I didn't like it. You know what I mean? And I knew I had to do something and yeah, you know, you're there every day. And I started talking to, to uh, Mr. Kubler, Kevin's dad. I remember talking to, to those guys and, um, you know, for years. And uh, when Richie got on, his brother, Stephen got on, Richie got on, or Richie got on first. I forget. Stephen got on first, Richie got on. Tom, his other brother, was going to get on, but uh, he couldn't get on for, uh, I guess he had a knee problem or something. I forget. And then, uh, and then me and Kevin talked about it. And then that's when I took the test and, uh, I actually, my mother made me fill out the paperwork. This was in the 80s, probably, because I took the 87 test. Mm. So this had to be like 86, yeah, probably like 85, 86, something like that. Mm -hmm. I went the last day, Mike, the last day that it could be in. Like, this form has to be in June 10th. It was June 10th. And I actually went down to where it had, I couldn't mail it because it wasn't going to get there, right? So I actually went down because it was on John Street which was short distance, a couple of blocks from Wall Street. I actually walked there with the form, the application. And there was two firemen standing in front there, handing out applications to people. And I had the application filled out and I gave it to them and they sealed it in an envelope and they slid it like under, I'm not kidding. They slid it under the door. Like two, there was piles of paper under there. I don't know if, if I think back, I really couldn't tell you. It doesn't make sense to me now, but they slid it under the door. They filed, they put it in an envelope and slid it under the door. And that's that was the beginning, you know, basically. So pretty weird, but oh, but it paved the way for something great as we'll talk about tonight. It's volume 39 of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite Lou Refrano is our guest. Shout out to everybody tuning in the live chat. Uh go through it quickly because you know sometimes I miss you guys and I feel terrible. Howie Blank's here, Robert Bates uh is here, and he says Lieutenant Lou, bad curtain for Frano. I gotta, I gotta do something with these curtains. <laughs> uh, we could help with that. Jay Driscoll, QCB Darren. Is here. Did Darren put the fire out yet up there, for God's sakes? Holy <laughs> Please, mackerel. Darren. I got so much smoke over here. I mean, it, it looked apocalyptic out here about a couple of weeks ago. So get on that, Darren. Aaron Cook, I might have mentioned you earlier. William Cooney. Uh, Joe Jarden's watching as his uh, chief Esposito. So both those guys are here. Holy mackerel. That. Now I'm nervous. Yeah, we got some heavy hitters tuning in tonight. That's via LinkedIn. And I appreciate all you being here as well as all you watching on Twitter. So at the time you're getting on, it's 92, 93. You come on the job in 93, of course, spring of 93. And as I mentioned before, Chief Lieb and I were talking about this the other day. The guys, firemen of the 90s and cops of the 90s were broken in by firemen and cops of the 70s and 80s that were on patrol working in firehouses when the city, as you talked about earlier, was quite frankly a cesspool. And even though it was a bad time for the city, some of the greatest firemen and cops in the city's history worked during that era. And on top of that, a lot of them had the military background. Maybe they were in Vietnam. You know, maybe they, they were in the Korean War. So they're teaching you. And it's intimidating. You go out to the rock, you see these guys that have done so much either abroad or at home. Tell me about your mentality going in that first day to the rock. 
Hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously I was, I was nervous, man. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about what I was going into. Like even Kevin, you know, I, I don't remember ever talking to Mr. Kubler, to be honest with you about that. I do remember, you know, keeping your mouth shut and, you know, doing all that stuff. And, uh, but I don't really ever remember. I remember the first day. I remember that a lot of guys were talking to each other. Right. So, and they all knew each other. It seemed like everybody knew each other except me. You know what I mean? Like, and as it turned out, I had a, I think I had a hundred, a hundred and whatever, hundred guys. And I would say probably 40 to 50 guys were huge in the fire department. I had Kenny DeFranco. I had all these guys, Grasso. I had so many, uh, um, Jerry McDonald, uh, there were so many guys whose fathers were chief and everybody went to an incredible place. I had Danny Wetzel. I had, there were so many guys that, you know, 231, they went to 147, 157. Um, everybody went to an incredible 105. Grasso went to 105. Um, I had Feehan's uh, son. He went to 252, if I remember right. Right. So He's still in the job, right? He is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. John Feehan. Yeah, he was. A, yep. He was. A, so it was just like all these guys knew each other. Bobby Canale from 58 and 26. Right. right? So mm -hmm. uh, his father was the head of transfers at the time. So um, it was just, you know, here I am. I don't know anybody. And, uh, you know, I didn't know where I was going to go. I did. You know, I did the best I could. At that time, I don't think it was really based on, you know, kind of more uh, merit based today. I mean, I'm sure you know, guys uh, have hooks and stuff, but, you know, if you don't know anybody and you do well in the, the physicals uh, end of the rock and you do well with the written stuff and the tests and you're in the top percentages there, you, you can go where you somewhat where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Right. So at that time, I don't know if that was the case. It was more who you knew. Right. So, um, you know, I didn't really know anybody. I was happy. You know, I was lucky to go. To 117, you know, it could have been a thousand times worse. I mean, at the time, I think that year they did like they had a huge area. They did like 5,500 runs. Most of it was pole boxes and false alarms, uh, but it was all occupied. They went from First Street under the bridge in Triborough all the way to like 94th Street, first due. Like it, it's incredible. They're on the highway all the time. They were first due at the Rock, uh, at um, uh, not at the Rock, at uh, between the hot rock and the hard place, Rikers Island. And they also go to, uh, they go to the airport. So, you know, I did pretty well there, uh, you know, right. Yeah. At, you know, get, get into that firehouse, I should say. Oh yeah. Full run, full plate, as we'll discuss before, of course, 1998 and a change of a lifetime going to sock, you know, so during this time, and just to go back to the rock real quick, what I love about it is that it's very multifaceted. Of course, there is training on what to do on the fire floor. You have trains there. You have collapse simulations. It's a lot more advanced now because technology has changed. But I imagine some of that stuff was around back then as well. Besides what to do on the fire floor, what other aspect of training, you know, uh, did you most enjoy? Uh, really caught your attention. Well, you know, what was weird to me was like nowadays at uh, the smokehouse, they actually burn hay or diesel, whatever they burn in there. It's, it's real smoke. Mm -hmm. Then I think they ended up taking that out and we had like, it was like a fake flame. It looked like a barbecue, right? <laughs> it was like propane or something. I don't remember exactly, but it was just like a propane thing. And you could actually put the water, like it was like covered with metal. So you couldn't put the flame out. So it was just like such a fake scenario. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense. I had Billy, I remember Billy Quick was uh one of the instructors there like one of those i think they had the video that you know they're making it they actually made a video the making of a firefighter when yep. we were there that week so mm -hmm. uh you know you were able to see a young uh you know dumb kid there with you know <laughs> but uh that that was a, that was pretty cool i remember watching uh what was it uh brother uh brothers in battle yep. right the, you know all the boroughs and everything like that um what sticks out to me now, which was pretty funny, is that some of the classes that they gave were that the new uh, windows were thermal pane, that we were going to start to see thermal pane windows. Um, we actually went up to to uh, a couple of it. We did a couple uh, drills at vacants in, uh, you know, some of the Bronx over there, I guess. 
but most of the guys said that we wouldn't you know that these windows are going to be you know obsolete that the new windows coming in were thermal panes you know what i mean and that's i mean obviously that was kind of like i would imagine the beginning of that mm -hmm. because now there that's it that's all we got of course and during this time as i've covered before i mean when you came on it was during the last months of uh, dinkins administration not too long after that is when rudy comes in and w as the city improved and the renaissance began you're seeing more building construction. Killed everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're seeing a lot of these different locations pop uh -huh. up and it's it's the potential for more work and we'll get to that later but real quick of course as we were talking about off the air we can get into it on the air now 117 is where you start in astoria your first job tell me about it so I came on with uh, with one of the guys actually in Proby School, James Devolio. So we both went to the same house, and um, I we got there I think July first or something like that. He worked before me, and his first tour on a pull box, he caught a third alarm factory fire down by uh, down the water over there, Twentieth Avenue somewhere over there. It was all ma all manufacturing over there. So I was thinking like, you know, this is going to be great. You know what I mean? So I come in. And we run around. My first run was for an overturn. I still have the ticket overturn on the Triborough with a, uh, a trailer with a backhoe on it flipped over. So that was my first uh, my first run. And then I didn't have any jobs. He came he came in because we were opposite and uh, he came in and he caught another job. I think he hit, he had like three or four jobs in the first. Yeah. First, like two months of like legit jobs you know like we went to food on the stove and stuff like that but like legit jobs right and so that was july august so beginning of september my birthday september 3rd mm -hmm. was so it was full of july august so two and a half you know two months i caught my first job like real job was uh a vacant uh not too far from where we shopped over there it was uh, 31st street and i'm gonna say 30th avenue somewhere over there mm -hmm. and uh i remember we pulled up and it was blowing out of a lot of windows, definitely on the top. It was a, like a Queen Anne style, you know, something similar to that. And uh, I remember getting up on the front porch and the guys, you know, the engine was there. 262 was the first engine there. I heard the boss say, you know, uh, we need the truck here. Pop the door. You know, it was like I remember it was like all weird. It wasn't like a regular door. It was like all st stuff chained around and everything. And uh, I mean, thank God I popped. I ended up taking the wood out and I popped the door pretty quick and uh the flames came out like over my head and i'll never forget i mean i still think about this now i never heard this ever again i heard the boss say plenty of fire for everybody boys <laughs> <laughs> and i remember the, en the engine started moving in uh i remember i mean i became very good friends with the guy who had the nozzle at that time his name was angelo the toma mm -hmm. and uh somehow i was able to wiggle in because we started moving in kind of at the same time and i didn't really know and i was kind of like third guy on the line like i could see that the nozzle was right in front of me he was on the left left side of the line the the backup man for, was on the right side of the line so i was actually almost like the backup guy because i was like almost right behind him right. just because it was so tight there was crap everywhere and it was i mean i still think about it, it was fire you know for a guy who was never in a building on fire to see everything was kind of clear which you don't get right so i see you know dressers on fire everything's on fire i guess because it was vented already so everything was kind of lit up nice so uh his helmet falls off and lands like in my lap right and he i see you know he goes like this so, like he turns around like this and i'm like i don't know what to do so i take the helmet and i put it on his head like that and he, i see him go like this you know so we start going in he gets to the next room like he's going back and forth because it's you know queen Anne. there's a lot of different rooms off of each you know doorway we go into the next room and he starts knocking fire down and it's darkening down and all of a sudden his helmet falls off again and it lands in my lap again yeah i pick it up i already know what to do now right i don't know i'm just hanging on for dear life i have no idea where my boss is you know nothing you know just put his helmet on as it turned out, my boss was, I'm not going to say who he was, but uh, he had a uh, reputation maybe for not exactly being the most aggressive guy. I think he had a lot of time on the job at the time, and uh, he was probably on his tail, you know, on the tail end of his career, and he was looking to get out. So uh, I ended up staying with the engine. Uh, as it turned out, the uh, OV in 117 and the OV, I believe, in 116, they went in through the back door and they made a grab uh, a homeless guy, a squatter. 
So uh, I actually have the doorknob. I'd have to look for it, but I kept the doorknob. That it was like an old brass doorknob. I, uh, one of the senior men in 117, Paulie Sokol, he gave me the doorknob. Uh, so I still had that for a, for a long time. That was my first job. That's amazing. And you never told that story before, too. So I mean, I don't I'm, think I ever told that story. No. <laughs> I'm happy you shared it here because think about it. Think about all the cock loss and cocktails that we've done. Think about all the Q&A shows that, you know, that's getting salty has done over the years. That story's never really come up. And, and, you know, the interesting thing about starting out at truck company is that, you know, and then again, this is no disrespect to the engines. Engines are just as important, just as great, too is that in the truck company, the functions are so different. Of course, an engine can respond to an MBA. An engine can respond to non-fire emergencies too. But when it comes to specifically at a fire scene, a lot of the venting that goes on either from the roof or inside, the truck the, the truck company is responsible for. And you have a lot of senior guys that, as you described earlier, the area that 117 covered, they've seen a thing or five. So tell me about, again, you mentioned one of them. Who were the guys besides Paul that really taught you a lot and that you most enjoyed learning from either by watching them or by talking with them directly? Well, I would say right off the, right off the box, uh, that particular captain, he was only there for six months while I was there. So, I mean, I've, I've talked about this man, uh, coming up, but so the captain retired after six months and then we got a new captain and his name's Del Coward, Delbert Coward. Um, Black guy named Coward in on a job <laughs> that's 90 at the time, probably 99% white, right? Um, and he, I mean, I've, I can't say enough about it, man. He, he, you know, speaks softly and carry a big stick, right? He didn't say much, but just by his actions at jobs, um, he was just, uh, we drilled more than, you know, we had been. I had a couple of senior guys there uh frankie mack who i'm trying to get on our show um at the time he probably had you know 20 years tall guy again didn't say much uh paulie sokol was probably nicky salmonese was a guy he had quite a few grabs he was a uh, really great chauffeur if i think back you know over the years really incredible chauffeur um that firehouse even though if you've ever seen that firehouse it's on astoria boulevard but it's it's kind of like canted off it. It's not perfectly square. It's kind of mm -hmm. canted like that. So to turn left against the grain, you can't do it. You know what I mean? But he right. was able to, he would be able to swing out wide, come into the wall and then back up because if you went right, you would lose a minute. You know what I mean? Trying to go all the way around the block if it was, you know, right on the left side of the firehouse. So, uh, uh, so I would say Paulie Rafino was a guy that I remember that, uh, you know, was uh, I was always on the rig, you know, at the time, you know, guys, you know, guys had 20 years and uh, 25 years. And, you know, we would do a couple quick things. But, you know, in the afternoon is the afternoon. But I always felt like I was always on the rig. Um, I was always I ended up making like some type of the Hearst tool used to just bang around uh, in 117. Yeah, you can't tell from that picture because it looks like it's square like the rig would back in perfectly square but it's actually yeah. canted like on some weird angle uh chauffeurs always had a problem parking the rig in there and um but uh what the heck was i just saying i forget what the heck i was just senior saying guys senior guys that helped you out a lot that you enjoyed learning from you left off on rafino yeah so poly ragu th those guys were um you know by 12 o'clock you know, two o'clock after lunch, it, we did a lot of running. I would say, you know, 5,500 runs. You're probably doing at the time, you know, 20 runs a day, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, sometimes more, sometimes less, obviously, but I would say somewhere around there. And we had, we had the number one pull box. I still remember the number 7514 uh, under the Astoria projects. It was the number one box in the city for false alarms. We would go there three, four times, at least minimally um in a 24 hour period and um but i have to say i still after all this time i still had pick out some of the jobs there that uh i had some really incredible jobs there um you know people say oh queens you know 290 103 whatever yeah but i i had a lot of jobs there because they had such a big area you know you were going to catch work somewhere some way uh 154 if they had a job you were going that way and they were doing a lot of work then too you know nobody really says oh yeah 154 is in the top or one thirty, you know 138 
you know, we didn't really go that far down to Corona unless it's, uh, you know, it was a bucket job, which I enjoyed to do. But of course, the guys hated going on the bucket. They'd be like, you know, Louie, get in the bucket. You know what I mean? Nobody wanted to go in the bucket. I was always in the bucket, you know. So, and then of course, I had Patty Lee. I had really good bosses, man. I had uh, Del Coward, Patty Lee, 124. I had Bill Urban. He just passed away, but they used to call him the Fonz, 108 guy, like legit. And Bill Donald, uh, 216 guy, right? So uh, those are my four bosses when I got there. And um, again, probably not much in the way. I mean, we drilled, but not the way I would, you know, I drilled. I drilled every day, all the time, every day, all the time, right? Those guys, they didn't do it all the time. But, uh, you know, I learned this wherever I could learn. You know, I did, uh, I think, four years there. I had put my paper in on the third, in my third year there. I put my paper in for 33 truck to go up to the Bronx. I wanted to do a little more work. And I knew a few guys that were up there. And, um, but then, uh, you know, I was in, I went to go see the captain. You want to talk about something that's really nerve wracking is to go sit in a fire, you know, walk through a bunch of guys in their firehouse, you know, with a cake or something to go talk to the captain. And they're like looking at you like, who the hell is this guy? You know, so, but, uh, I went to see Captain Finnamore up in 33 truck two, you know, two or three times. And I think I was the next guy to go there. Uh, that was like 97, probably, you know, and uh, then the squad thing came up, you know, for the most part. And let's talk about that, because, of course, like many people have pointed out, it's not that the Special Operations Command of the FDNY was immediately formed in 1998. As I mentioned when I was doing the introduction earlier, the squads were augmented into that, and it was kind of formulated around engine companies that Von Essen felt at the time. And this was a great thing that he did, and he deserves a lot of credit for, especially now as SOC is going to turn 25 tomorrow. The squads at least are going to turn 25 years old tomorrow. Uh, that, you know, okay, these engine companies are not getting a lot of work. If we could retool them as a squad where all of a sudden their area of expertise and their area of response is enhanced and they can go to citywide – Let's incorporate it. Now, there were some objections. If you ask Bobby Gallione, <laughs> if he had it his way, the squads would have never been. Yellow guys, right? Exactly. You know, our, our, my little yellow friends, as you would call them, guys. Friends. You know, the squads would have never been formed. But nevertheless, this was a great thing. And see, as Hank mentioned when he was on, guys of his stature did not have to try out. Newer guys did. And if you don't know anybody, it's tough. So how did you make your way into that pack to at least be able to get a tryout? So this is another funny story I don't think I've ever said. So this was... I didn't even know about that, to be honest with you. And uh, a young fellow who uh, he probably had two years more than me at the time. Uh, he's a deputy chief now in the third, Nick Corrado, deputy chief yep. Corrado. He was in 117, and I became very close friends with him there. He called me up one day, and he's like, we got to try out. I guess he knew. You know, I don't know how he, he's like, we got to go try out for the squad. I'm like, the squad? What squad? Like, he's like. We got to go try out. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to 33 truck. You know, I'm that's it. I'm, I'm in, you know? And he said, do you know the opportunity that is, that is here right now? Like, do you know, do you hear yourself? Like I remember in breaking my chops, we had a very, I was just talking to him the other day. We have a very close relationship even to this day. And he was, uh, he's like, I remember, I just, I tell this to my kids all the time. Let me think about how he says it. He's like, Louis, we are living in exciting times. That's what he's just saying to me all the time. So, and uh, he's like, "We got you. Got to try out. At least you got to go try out." So, and I remember at the time. I don't. I shouldn't say I remember exactly, but it wasn't exactly uh, the job or the guys weren't exactly exactly happy about that. If I remember right, it was you were kind of like going down on your own time. You know, it wasn't against the union type of thing to go to this tryout, to go to, you know, sock or whatever. So, you know, the majority of guys probably were against it just because you were going down, you know, on your own time. And even to this day, if guys, you know, you say something, they'd be like, ah, you went, you scab, you went down on your own time, you know, to go try out. Like, so um, we went to, he convinced me to go. It was Nick, uh, you know, Nick uh, who convinced me. Um, and, uh, Myself, James Devolio, who I came on with, and uh, and Nick, we went down, and I mean to this day I still remember the faces. Um, Norton, right? Uh, Tommy Burke, Cheese Man was there. Uh, you know all these guys that you know I had 
lifelong relationships with. They all were down there at the time trying. I remember Tommy Burke was kind of like running the whole thing. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, they made us cut, you know, like a roof uh, simulator, four stores. You know, I don't remember all the things that we did, stretch lines or any of that stuff. But um, yeah, and then when I, I don't remember what the time frame was. I think it was all happening pretty fast. And uh, I remember getting a call from Cap Murphy um, to uh, to start. I actually was the first guy in engine 288. So he's like, all right, you, you're in. Are you in? Yeah, I'm in. All right. You're going to start Saturday at 0900. You're the, you're you're going to take over as, quote unquote, you know, the squad. So you could imagine what that was like a fart in church, right? Walking into 288 like these guys are leaving, which was one of the few companies I'm sure, you, you know, you've talked to those guys that almost everybody left. Mm -hmm. Right. None of the Coop's guys stayed. Only about two guys stayed. Yeah. So no, no. And those guys, uh, the one guy, I think, stayed like on a hardship, Weinstein or Weinberg. And then the other guy uh, was Anthony Tito. And um, but everybody was brand new. So that was one of the few squads that did that. So it was really a, a special thing because we were all learning for the first time for the most part. And that's when I met Hank and all those guys. But uh, it was a pretty interesting. Uh, you know, I say all the time, there's only a few times in your career. There's like special times, right? You, every part is great for the most part, but there's really some sweet spots in between that that really – you're really motivated and everybody's on the same page and you're going to work and all everything like lines up perfect. And I have to say that that time really was, uh, it was good competition, healthy competition. Every, you know, there was a lot of young guys. There was some older guys, Hank, Ronnie Geese, Jerry Murphy was great. Uh, Joe Fable. So there was like a bunch of older guys, Christian Okio. Um, he only stayed in, he ended up getting promoted right away. So um, Bill Hill. So there was a bunch of guys that really helped uh, the younger guys. I was kind of middle of the road. I had about four years on. Right. And then there were all these young guys that were going to be the best that the job had. I mean, Joe Hunter, uh, Jonathan Ielpi, Brian Sweeney, Petey Brennan, Matt Neary. I mean, all these guys had a couple of years on the job. Um and, you know, unfortunately, I mean, it's just those guys were going to be the best that we had on the job. You know, they were into the job and, uh, you know, obviously that, you know, 9-11, all that stuff. But right. It's funny. A quick story on Pete Brennan. Uh, Chris Strom is a former guest of the show and a friend of mine. He was a sergeant in the NYPD, finished out in the intelligence division. Really sharp guy. And he worked with Pete when Pete was a cop. And he said that even when Pete was a cop, he's out of all his mind. Yeah, he, he would say all, all Pete would say was that he wanted to be a fireman. fireman. Oh, a fireman. that guy was ble So we weren't even we weren't even a squad yet, theoretically, right? We ca we came on, uh, I think we came on line tomorrow, right, as a squad. But we were there in May, I think, if I remember. So May, June, yeah, like two or three months where we were learning all of, you know, all the stuff, you know, collab, do, just trying to get up to speed. You know, didn't they didn't send us right away on on jobs? You know, I mean, we had to get up. We were still an engine basically, but we were drilling and doing all that stuff. And then uh, July second was the first day, right? So I think within a month, less than a month, Pete made the, a knot board for the firehouse. It's still there, right? It's legit. Like it was incredibly done. It had all the names of all the original members he had on both sides of this knot board. And, uh, you know, it's still there, you know, and, um, you know, not to hopscotch it forward too, too much, but Go ahead. there was a time where when I first came back as Lieutenant, it was a little weird because like three quarters of those guys either were gone or no, there was no, I think one guy, I think besides Coobs, who else was there? I think it was Coobs and some, maybe one other guy, uh, two other guys. Otherwise it was just, you know, from when I was there and all those guys on that board. And I used to say, I used to, you know, go down and smoke a cigar, hang out, like walk around at one o'clock in the morning, or whatever, if I wasn't sleeping. And I would look up at the board and I used to say, if, if I was back in 1998 looking up at this board and I would say, 
which guy am I going to be? Like, am I going to be here in 2009 looking at this if I knew that three quarters of those guys, you know, weren't going to be there? Or, you know, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, it was a little surreal. It was just, you know. And then as time went on, when Kevin got out, you know, I was the only one, you know, that was even still on the job, if I remember. I mean, I don't even remember. There's only a few guys, you know, scattered around. But um, most guys had gotten either retired or uh, were promoted and, you know, moved on. But it was like a weird, you know, scenario. It, it's it's kind of like, you know, I, I remember in, in uh, Derek Jeter's last season with the Yankees back in 2014. This popped into my head because Gonzo's in the chat. Him and I are big Yankee fans, of course. Michael K was mentioning something on the broadcast, and he's bringing up the 96 Yankees. And then he points out Jeter's the last active guy at the time from the 96 Yankees that's still playing. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little, it's a little, you're right. It is a little surreal being that last piece of the original history. Yeah. You know, because let's say even if that terrible day didn't happen, eventually guys get promoted, guys retire. Like you said, it's 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 surreal to say the least. I don't, I, just, I can't sum it up any better than you. Just I'm did. a very nostalgic guy. I've always been, you know, I guess maybe you know something to do with my old man. Like I, I have his badge in my, you know, in my gun cabinet, right? I have, I say, I'm very sentimental with a lot of things like that. So you know, even in the firehouse, there was. Um, I think I told the story, Joe Hunter and myself, Jonathan, I a bunch of guys. We go out to the wicked monk in Brooklyn, you know, we have a boys night out and we're hanging out. And of course, you know, nothing good can happen there. Right. So <laughs> somebody looks up and there's this gargoyle, like, uh, <laughs> right. It's like this gargoyle with like a candle behind it. Like, you know, he's perched on the, like, but it's plaster, right. But it's up on the wall and they, and they got them throughout the whole bar. I don't even know if they still have it or if it's even the place is still there, but, uh, Somebody comes up with an idea. We got to take that back to the firehouse, you know? So, uh, we, you know, I don't even know what we did. We hoist somebody up. Somebody grabs it. It's in the jacket. Next thing you know, next set, possibly it's hanging in the firehouse, right? And next thing you know, we're, we're making fires. You know, we got candles to, to the fire gods to go to fires and do all this stuff, right? You know, just to, to do any of that stuff. And uh, Jonathan, of course... He was some pepper man. It's after Christmas. It's probably like January something. And we got the old Christmas tree and allegedly possibly could have happened. I heard it happened. He likes to, he puts the, the uh, tree underneath the, 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 the to, to, to give this fire to the gods, right. To, to get fire to, to, you know, so we can go to a fire. But what happens is the, the tree goes on fire so fast, possibly in the firehouse that it burns the, the thing's made out of ceramic. So it actually, it, it's impinged on it, right? And then after a while, the thing kind of explodes. But you could see the black soot mark like perfectly where this was, right? So fast forward after 9-11, it's, it's still there. And after that, I come back, you know, every 9-11, even though I was in 290 when I got promoted in 2002, I would go to, I would come back obviously for, for 9-11. And I would always look at that mark that it was still there, right, for years. And then 2009, 2010, I come back and um, it's still there. So I say to one of the guys, like at roll call, because we sit right there. I'm like, hey, you know what? See that mark right there? You know what that is? And the guy's like, no, what is that? I'm like, you know what that is? And none of the guys obviously know what it is. And I'm like, you know, that's a special thing, man. That's from my boy Jonathan when he was burning to the, uh, to the gods of, uh, you know, for fire duty, you know, so it's still there. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty wild after all this time that you could still see the outline of the gargoyle. Like if you really look close, otherwise you would just think it's dirty like everything else. But, right. um, and then as, as by chance, this is just stuck in my head. So right where that gargoyle was, there was a sign that said Maurice Avenue that myself and Brian Sweeney, he ended up passing away 9-11. Um, on Maurice Avenue, it was hanging off. I guess there's a lot of trucks down by Maurice. So mm -hmm. I guess the truck was making a turn and hit the sign. It was hanging off, you know, by like a little piece of strap metal. So I remember Sweeney goes, hey, jump up on rough, jump up on my on my shoulders. Take the sign. We'll hang it up in a firehouse. So I'm like, all right. So I get up there. I got my clippers. I clip the thing. We get the sign and there's a steam pipe right there. Somebody gets the, uh, you know, a little clamps or whatever. We put the, and we put the sign on there. Right. 
So one day, so it's been there for years, right? For years and years and years. By chance, one day I'm coming in and I see the sign in the garbage, like outside. I'm coming into to work. I see the sign in the garbage. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? So I pull the sign out of the garbage and I bring it inside and I put it right by the roll call, you know, like where we're going to have roll call. So the guys come down, you know, and uh, I don't say nothing about the sign. I don't remember how it went exactly, but it was something similar to this. So we're sitting there and somebody's like, somebody says, uh, hey, how'd that sign get back in here? I just threw that out. I'm like, oh, you, you threw it out? How, do you know, you know where that sign, where that sign came from? You know what that sign is? You know where, where it is? What it was? He's like, no, no, rough. I don't, I don't know. I'm like, that's Brian Sweeney's idea to pilfer that and possibly bring it in the firehouse, allegedly. So we're going to today put that sign exactly where it was. It's going to stay there until forever you understand because that's and you're going to make sure that that story gets passed on because that's brian sweeney you know what i mean and that's right. like i said i come back to sentimental things like those little things mean a lot to me just uh you know and every time i go in there i look at this the burn mark i look at uh you know i look at the sign i have uh captain murphy uh his wife carol gave us a letter from it was probably December, December of 2001. Um, basically, I mean, if I think about it, it'll make me choke up. But, you know, how proud they were for of us for all the work that we did, you know, going going down to the site and all the stuff that we went through and all that stuff. So I had it in my locker forever. And I'm like, every time I would open it, I would say how special this letter was coming from the two of them. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, from from the captain and uh, and his wife. And, um, you know, how proud they, you know, they were of us and all. And we were kids, you know what I mean? So I ended up putting it in a frame and it's right on the wall, right below. We have all the pictures of the guys and then uh, from 9-11. Then we have the pictures of the the, the uh, present day guys. And then we have some stuff like stuff that we found. We found glass down at 9-11, some other things that we made like a little shadow box. And then this, yep. that letter is right there um under glass to make sure that everybody could read that so that uh you know again it doesn't get lost on what was happening back then right it's easy to look you know talk about stuff right now but you know there was some crazy stuff going on you know right after that for the guys that were still you know wasn't easy obviously well, of course and paulie rogers was just in the show last friday and you were housed with him in hazmat one he was talking about it you know everybody felt it you knew the hazmat guys too so it was it was a tough time, but those little tidbits and anything that's historic, it's easy to forget the context of the time, as you just said. Right. It'd rather if it's good history or bad history. Mm -hmm. But those items, those visuals, it could put anybody that appreciates it enough right back in that time frame. Well, that's like I say, that's special to me. Like that, mm -hmm. I take, you know, I try to I, I can sense that my kids have of some of that because I remind them of things that, hey, this was grandma Kathy, this is grandpa comments, this is you know, I get the sense that they like those things because it was special to me. So it's special to them. You know what I mean? So uh, I think that that gets kind of passed on down a little bit, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's important. It, you know, and that's what I love about the FDNY, amongst many things, is that the tradition, there's such an emphasis on not just the history of the department, but maintaining it. Frank Lee was talking about that the other day with you guys. It's a maintenance of that tradition and that those stories get passed on to where even if someone wasn't there when it happened, they're just as familiar with it as someone yeah, right. who was. And that's a great thing about the FDNY. It really is. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about real quick before I move on to 290 and 103 is that in 98, and Coobs brought this up and then you touched on it just now, that first box that came in, I was looking for the picture. I couldn't find it. You were on that first I had run. the first job. Tell me about that. Oh, my God. So, uh, and allegedly, possibly, could have happened. I heard it happened. Uh, somebody was getting off and because it was right at the change of tours, if I remember, and somebody jumped on. So, uh, it was in... Flushing, 274's area, I think, 273, 274, somewhere over there, and uh, multiple dwellings, six-story, um, and uh, I think it went to Third Alarm, and <laughs> I mean, just thinking about it now is making me laugh, so uh, uh, I help you again, man, aggressive guy, he ends up going up, like, uh, you know, after we get into the building, he ends up going up to the... Uh, up the fire escape he gets up on the floor above 
and uh, it's not going so good. That's, I think, why it went to second alarm or third alarm. But so now he's kind of stuck in there and he can't get out, you know. So now we find the apartment door and we start forcing the door. So we're banging on the door, you know. But because we were banging on the door, it helped him to find a way out. I think he was kind of jammed up a little bit, maybe. I don't remember exactly. But next thing you know, we're like forcing the door and the door swings open, like from the inside. He's on the inside. <laughs> And he's like, you know, like, whoo, thank God, thank God, don't go in there. It's bad in there. You know, like, so we ended up getting out of there. But, you know, we ended up finding the apartment he was in. And, uh, yeah, we took that picture. I remember that. I remember saying, man, this is going, that was the first run the first day, right? So I remember, I'm like, man, this is going to be, this is going to be fun, man, you know. And it was. And it absolutely was. And getting into 2002 now. Now, by this point, you're at that middle period, that perfect middle period in your career where you have just about a decade on nine years and you make lieutenant. And of course, now there's that uh, interesting evolution for anyone that's new in any kind of authority position, either in PD or FD, where you have to learn how to be a sergeant or learn how to, in the fire department's case, how to be a lieutenant. And of course, you have to go elsewhere to do that. So going to 290, you're replacing Richie Dumick, former guest of your show, former guest of my show too. Great fire officer. Guys love working for him. So that's not easy. And you're going there during what's a very big transitional time. And besides the losses of 9-11, a lot of really knowledgeable guys are retiring. So going there during that particular time period, as if being a new fire officer isn't stressful enough, did that put any added pressure on you? Well, it is very stressful. I mean, the whole thing is you know, just you're in charge, right? doesn't matter you're, you're making the decision. So that's why generally, you know, before you get promoted, you'll sit in the front, you know, I've done that before with guys who were getting promoted. Um, you know, they'll, you know, Captain Evans did that with me, uh, when he was covering, um, he would sit in the back and I would be the boss and I would sit in the front and, uh, in, when I was in 288, but when I got promoted, I got assigned to the five, seven in Brooklyn and I bounced around. I worked in one Oh two. I worked in uh, 235, Finian Garrow became the captain there. He was my lieutenant in 288. He became the captain there. He would always ask for me to uh, do vacations there. I think I did two vacations there in 235. Um, I bounced around. I worked in, you know, all over the place, 204, 124, some of the fire. I, my first job as a lieutenant was in 119 truck. Um, so, uh, but um, I think that little couple of months, so I got promoted in uh, June of 02. And then I got to 290 in December of 02. So I had a few months to feel it out a little bit, you know, get my bearings a little bit. And um, again, Captain, well, at the time, Chief Coward, my captain from 117, I get a phone call. I was trying to get into 235. There was an opening there. I was hoping to work with uh, Vinny Angaro. Um, but uh, there was another guy who had, you know, been there. And, um, so he ended up getting it, uh, Greg Stadler, Greg Stadler, I think. And, um, out of the blue, I get a phone call from, uh, chief coward. He's like, uh, Lewis. I said, Hey chief, what's going on? You know, he always called me Lewis. Um, he's like, listen, I have an opening in my battalion in engine 290. And I wanted to know if you'd be interested in, uh, coming down and, uh, and working here. I'm like, yeah, of course I would do. Of course I'm, I'm in, you know what I mean? So he starts talking and the way he's talking, I'm like, well, hold on one second. Let me get this straight. I said, nobody wants to go there. He goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, he, but he goes, I think it'll be, uh, I think it'll be perfect for you. You know, I think you have the personality to be there. So I said, listen, if you think it's good for me, I'll, I'm going. So I said, when do I start? He's like, I'm going to put you there. I'm going to call the, the division right now. And then I went there, my first tour. I never worked there, which is always, obviously, if you know, you talk to somebody, you would like to be there, covering there, let the guys know you type of thing, you know? And um, so I walk in there. I mean, my first day, the guys still talk about this. The first day I walk in there, I don't really know anybody. Obviously, I've never worked there, but I've been covering in the borough. So I, I was pretty, I was nervous, but. I was, I felt all right, if I remember. And I walk in and guy opens up the door. He's like, Hey Lou, how you doing? He doesn't know that I have the spot there, you know, not the spot, but I'm going to be UFO there, whatever. So I shake his hand. I walk in and there's like 10 guys arguing, like arguing, like, rah, 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 you know, whatever, you know? So I'm like, what's going on? You know, I'm like, I don't know. I put my, my stuff down. I got a cake in my hand, you know, and I walk in 
And there's two guys arguing like, you know, this, this, you know, whatever, this, that, you know, whatever. So I kind of walk past everybody and I go into the kitchen and looks like a senior guy there. It turns out he is one of the senior guys there. He's a senior guy. He's got his, the paper open. He's by himself in the kitchen with a covering cap. There's a covering cap in there pouring coffee. He's got the paper out and he's kind of reading his paper. Did I lose you? No, I'm here. Oh, um, so he's reading the paper. So I walk in, I make myself a cup, talk to the captain. I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's like, hey, how you doing, Lou? Okay, good, good, good. So I get my cup of coffee, right? I'm standing there like this. I'm talking to the captain. Like, yeah, I'm covering you. All of a sudden, all the guys pile in like, you know, there's like all this commotion going on, right? And I'm like, you know, I got my cup of coffee like this. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, blink, blink, you know, and it's loud. Like they're like, screw you, this, that, you know, whatever. We don't do that, you know, whatever this. And now I'm thinking, I'm looking at the cat. I'm like, should, do I have to get involved here? Like, I, I just walked in the door. You know what I mean? Like, so my, what am I supposed to do here, right? Like, what are you supposed to do? Sure as heck. I'm like, the guy who's reading the paper, senior man, he's got his glasses like down here. You know, he's like reading the paper like this, you know? And I'm like, he's like, oh, oh, we don't do that here. We don't do that here. And all the guys are like, you know, they all stop and they're listening to him. Right. And I'm like, thinking to myself with the coffee. I'm like, oh, oh, thank God. You know, like somebody's got some. He's like, we don't do that here in the kitchen. We go downstairs if you want to do that. And the guys are like, ah, and they like pile out. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the captain looks at me. I, they all they were going to go down the basement. I don't know what the hell they were doing. So I'm like, holy shit. So the captain runs out. I run out, you know, and uh, we go out there. And uh, I mean, thank God nothing came of it. But the guys still laugh. They're like, rough. Tell the story. The first day you walked into 290, they were like, well, you should have known the run. You know what I mean? Like, uh, get the hell out of here. It's mayhem over here. But right. Right. It's no. a pretty funny story. No, it is everything and everything. I didn't fight, out. by the way, no. either. So good, yeah. good, good. You know, allegedly, even if they didn't allegedly, it, allegedly possibly. Covered, I heard they did possibly, you know. you know, maybe we hope we hope we pray. <laughs> we hope <laughs> we <they> think <laughs> 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 we'd like to believe, you know, and there's always that first moment eventually for any fire officer that's worth his or her weight in the fire service, especially in a department as big and as expansive as the FDNY, where you feel, OK, finally, I got my feet under me. You don't know everything, but you're at least comfortable in the rank. And now that you have a steady command, there's time to hone that skill and there's time to hone that leadership. Where was the moment in 290 where you finally felt, OK, I feel like I got my feet under me now as a lieutenant? That's a good question, Mike. Thank you. I would say. It's probably about a year, right? The more running you do, like over there, obviously, I mean, I had been running around. I was in 102, I, like I said, 124. I was running around, but I would say it's probably give or take about a year before you start to feel like anything could come your way where you could handle it, right? Does that make sense? Like you can, you, it's, I mean, there's always going to be an oddball thing that, you know, you're not really sure. You know, I used to laugh all the time. Like, you know, we got an odor right in the subway so now you go down three flights into the subway and you're like you smell something it's two o'clock in the morning you know all the guys are looking at you because you're the boss and now you're like i smell something so now the chief's like what do we got and you're like we got something i don't know like what do you make you know you make it an 18 you make it a 33 you make it you know like what do you do do you do you keep looking the guys want to get the hell out of there right so you have this balance between you know it's not really smoke it's not this it's not that you know what do you do so I think that those little those little things where uh, those little jobs where you're not really sure, it's kind of like the oddball thing. It takes a little bit of time where you feel confident enough to say, uh, you know, see if you get a 10-7, see if you can get more information. You know, I have an order down here. We're going to check for CEO, whatever it is. You're going to just, you know, wiggle through it because you're not really sure what the heck's going on. You know what I mean? I had a run in 290 where – we got there at three in the morning and, and there's a guy there, you know, for electrical thing. And uh, I pull up and there's a guy there with his dog. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Did you call? And he's like, uh, yeah, my dog was peeing on the pole and he got electrocuted. I'm like, yeah, what do you do there? Tell me what you would do there, Mike. I don't know. <laughs> do you go touch the pole? I, you know, I'm like, Say a prayer. You know, yeah. I mean, what do you do? So I'm like, well, the dog looks all right. You look all right. You know, I'm like, don't touch the pole. You know what I mean? So I'm like. How do you know he was electrocuted? Did you get electrocuted? He's like, no. But the dog, I'm like thinking to myself, oh, my God. You know, but I'm saying all these like little calls add up, you know, right. over time. You do 20 of those a day or even if you're not in a busy place or whatever, you know, running wise. So I think that that's uh, 
about a year, I would say. And then after that, you know, as, as you put more and more time and that's the experience thing, I think you earn that, you know, there's no doubt for myself that if I had a guy, an officer who was really calm and cool and didn't waste time and, you know, all of those things, that's what I really looked at as far as um, that I wanted to be. Right. I wanted right. to be the guys that guys felt so comfortable with whatever I was going to do, even if they didn't like what I was going to say, they were comfortable with that answer. Right. Um, and that came, like I've said that before, you still have to be yourself. Right. I'm never going to be Captain Murphy. Right. I'm never going to be Del Coward. I'm never going to be those guys because it's not my personality. Right. So I still have to be myself, but I want to take some of those special qualities of those guys that I remember over time, you know, just that what, what I liked that they did, it made me feel comfortable as a fireman, especially if it's a crappy situation, right? Do I trust this guy enough to stay here or, or, or not stay here or go on the tracks or do this or do that where, you know, I'm, I'm over here, but I'm telling you to go over there. Right. So, so I think it's important that you have the trust that they're, you're always looking out for them and they know that. Right. They're going to feel that all the time. It's I used to say all the time, you know, La Familia, we're always together. It's the family, uh, you know, team. The guys used to make fun of me all the time because I used to be like team, team, you know, from the movie. Uh, I forget what the heck that was with uh, Al, uh, Al Capone. With uh, Kevin Costner. Yeah. Team, team, team. And then he smacks him with the bat. The Untouchables. The Untouchables. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So team, team. So that was a big thing for me is that we were always doing stuff together. Always. You know, we don't never go against the family, right? If you have a disagreement, we could come back and talk about it. But, you know, if I'm a 288, you're in 288, it's 288. That's it. You're in 290, one house, one mission, right? It didn't matter if you didn't agree with the guy. You weren't going against that guy, you know, in the, from another firehouse, right? You're going to talk about it when we got back, but... It was one house, one mission. That's what we used to say all the time. Absolutely. And it's a simple statement, but it's one to be taken seriously. To CFD 335, 346, I see your question. It's a very good one. I'll get to it in a second. But you just touched on something interesting to where, and you've talked about it before on Salty. Now it is 10, 11 years in the job. And not just that. Now of those 10 or 11 years, it's about a couple of them, two or three, as a fire officer. And the beauty of it is you've had so many different bosses to this point and not even official bosses, sometimes a senior man that kind of functions as a boss, if you will, in a firehouse to where you can take each detail from each person that you like the most and fuse it into your personality because the best leaders in anything, sports, the fire service, are those that take those good points and even look at the bad points and say, okay, well, that's not what I, that's not what I want to do and incorporate it, mesh it with their own personality. Those are some of the best lieutenants, captains, chiefs that you'll find. I agree. 1,000%. Yeah. And now to CFD 335-346's question, and he's asking specifically when you were a lieutenant, where did you give your first 1075 as a fire officer? Uh, it was a 119. It was a store uh, fire. And like a, it was a three-story I don't know if it was frame or brick, but it was three story. The store was on the first floor and the fire was in the basement in the Bilco. And uh, I remember the guys cut the lock on the Bilco. We had the line coming and uh, the door opened. I went down the basement and there were stacks of soda. I remember on the right. I went to the right. I started coming all the way around from the right side on the right wall. And uh, I don't I don't even remember if I had a camera at that time. I don't even think I did. 2002. I don't even remember. Um, and I found it in the back. It was like a, uh, it was like the oil burner. It was nasty. It was like an oil burner with some pallets and all sorts of crap in there. And, uh, I ended up coming all the way back. I told, you know, line came in and, uh, that was it. But I think that those, you know, again, those little jobs, um, like that, that job there, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. John Paul DeGioria. I, one of my first jobs in two in 290, you know, again, like you say, so I, I don't really know the guys in 119. Obviously, I want to do the best I could do. But when I got assigned to 290, I think it was my second 24. I had a job uh, first due and um, came in as uh, they had a lot of like. There was like blocks over there where they had like 
not, not junk uh, yards, but it was like blocks where they had all of these uh, garages where they would work on cars. Right. So the street was like not a real street. It was it was a street, but it was like there was no curbs. It was just like a crappy area. You know, it was all oil in the street type of thing, you know. So we got a call for fire in the building. I don't remember what it was for, but I remember pulling up and this one I remember three story brick uh, roll um, roll down gate and just, you know, cars all over the place in the front. But roll down gate and the smoke is seeping out of every crack around that thing. Like it's it's coming out of the windows. It's coming out like it's it just you could tell it's like smoky, nasty, you know, in there. And so the truck started opening up the gates and we rolled the roll down. Um, I think if I remember right, I don't know if we cut the gate or if we rolled it up. I don't remember. But as soon as I had the opportunity to go in there. I went in there. I put my uh, Mike McVeigh was the uh, truck boss and he had a camera. And because uh, I, I remember him telling me the story. So I go in right away because I want to, to your point, I want to prove to the guys that I'm in the right spot and they got the right guy. Right. So I crawl in. I don't even remember how deep it was. I remember it was deeper than I liked it to be. <laughs> it was, I don't know, 60 feet. And I yeah. get in the, I follow the wall all the way back. There's shit every, ooh, sorry, Mike. There's crap all over the place. And I find there's a car on fire in the back and there's a car on the lift on fire in the back. Jeez. So, yeah. So I call for the line. They bring the line back there. They knock the fire down. Obviously, nobody wants to go in there with a, with a car. Yeah, it's Junius. It's Junius. Yep. So, uh, um, QC Beast, that's exactly where it was, Junius. And, um, it was uh nobody wanted to go there obviously because we didn't know if the car was going to fall off the off the uh, lift you know and um i came out i remember and i took my face piece off and i mean around my face was like the color of this my ear i mean it was such a you know think about car fires it's just black and nasty you know accurate accurate and i remember the guys i remember i felt like they were kind of like all right, this might be the guy. You know what I mean? So you definitely get that sense to let, you know, that you want to prove to the guys. Everybody's gauging everybody all the time, right? Where did you work? How much time you got? So that's really, uh, that's, uh, it's an important thing as a boss. If you want to have guys respect you and follow you, that they have to trust you when it's pretty crappy, you know, so. And keep in mind, this job is not too long after Louis Van Valentino in 1996. Illegal chop shop, cars, you know, that might have contributed to the collapse there that unfortunately claimed his life. Uh, Louis Valentino. Of course, it was kind of like that. Too. It was crappy. Oil everywhere. I mean, it was nasty, nasty, mm -hmm. nasty. I so, don't miss that, Mike. No, I, I imagine <laughs> most guys don't. Everything else, yeah. But situations uh, like that, no, I, I don't blame you. Real quick note, because I wanted to talk about him, you know, the testament to a good leader is not just during the good times, but the bad times when crisis hits. And there's not a bigger crisis than when a member is injured in the line of duty or when a member is killed in the line of duty. And that was the case, unfortunately, with Richard Clefani on Black Sunday in 2005. Two-part question, then we'll talk about some of your fonder memories of Richie. I know he's one of your favorites, so I know you got a lot of good stories about him. But just in general, when something like that happens, I mean, and that, that's a position no fire officer ever wants to be in. What's the key, just a general overview of successful leadership and being able to rally around the men and lift them up during a time when they're mourning and you're mourning too? That's a good question. Uh, well, unfortunately, I would say I had I had some experience, right? So I had a lot of experience. So uh, it was, uh, I don't want to say it was easier, but I kind of knew the roadmap, like what had to be done, like who we had to notify, like who we had, what, what was the process we had to do um, with the guys, obviously. And then, you know, we ended up, you know, now it's kind of a commonplace thing. You know, we, you get a shirt made up and you sell it and you, you know, try and, you know, do um, uh, 
keep his name alive with the kids, right? You do scholarships and all this stuff, right? We tried to do all that stuff. And that was all the things that we kind of did, you know, through 9-11. But it, it, it ain't easy, man. It's just, it's a never, it just, I've said this before, like when I got there December of 02 to 05, those couple of years, that was like a sweet spot for me again. You know what I mean? Like I felt like I was home. I found, you know, I had been bouncing around for a couple of months. I found this place that everybody was all on the same page. Um, they, I felt great there. You know, by that time, 2005, I had been there a couple of years already. So I had, a, you know, passed that one year, quote unquote, time. So I felt comfortable in everything. I was going to work. Um, you know, we were racing to boxes. It was a lot of fun. You know, Hold'em was big. You know, Richie used to love to play Hold'em. Um, and, uh, you know, he was dating a lot of girls. I was kind of living through him, you know, because I was <laughs> married and everything. So he's a handsome guy. Oh, he was he was doing all right. You know, he had pictures and stuff. It was great. But um, um, you know, we used to go to hold them tournaments, you know, a couple guys in the firehouse. We used to go to his house to play cards. We used to go to Jimmy Gers back, a bunch of guys were all into it. So we hopscotch around to everybody's house. And um, you know. Like anything, you get your feet, uh, the rug, rug pulled out from underneath you. You know, it just, it changed the firehouse. And then it kind of wasn't the same um, for, a, a, for a little while. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a big loss. You know, you're constantly doing all the stuff. We started having, you know, obviously we have um, his mass every year, 23rd, right? Right. And so... It's just, you never forget, we had plaque put on the rig. Um, I, I post it all the time. It Basically, where he was sitting that day on the rig is a plaque across that the guy who's sitting in that chair says, you're you're sitting in a chair that, you know, Richie Scafani was in, you know, uh, I, I don't know all the words exactly, but it's kind of like, never forget, make him proud, you know, do the job and uh, give 100%, you know, something to those lines and... Uh, so I thought that was a great thing that we did this way. Like to your point before, guys who come there, he's just not a plaque on the wall. He's a plaque on the rig. And you're, every run you go on, you're staring at that plaque. It's it's eye level, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, and it says the last line I remember is like, make him proud. So, yeah. No, and it's, it again, it, it is a part of history and it's important because there's nothing more noble, right? It says it in the Bible. If you ever read the Bible, no, you know, greater love, had no man than this and to lay down his life for his friends and that's what he did that day and i think the interesting thing get my train of thought back is that actually this is what one thing i did want to touch on it brings up a conversation i had off the air with an nypd detective friend of mine he worked in the 13th precinct then in 1997 uh i don't know if you remember this his partner was uh anthony sanchez who got shot and killed in a robbery on the upper west side and what he was telling me was you know we went through that it was terrible obviously and in the 13th precinct, four years later, they lose two officers on 9-11. Next door is ESU truck one, and they lost a the guy at 9-11. So it feels like right when you're starting to kind of heal from something like that, then comes yeah, the next yeah. obstacle. And it's a big test. And when you said the rug gets lifted out from under you, that is the case. But, you know, you guys were able to soldier on. And before I get back to you going into SOC again in 2009, and we'll talk about that a little bit too, and Sandy and a few more things before we hit the rapid fire. Um, was it, you know, you, you didn't leave your guys during this time. Of course you helped them through it. They got through it, even though it's bittersweet, they soldiered on. Like I said, did that make it a harder decision to leave for sock again in 2009? Or by that point, were you ready to move on into something else? Mike, you got a lot of good questions. I would say, I, my best. <laughs> I would say, um, we make fun if if you work there it's like dog years there right mm -hmm. so one year is like seven <laughs> so <laughs> you know by the time i did i did a lifetime there you know and, and there were guys there that that you know my chauffeur there had over 25 years there you know uh working there so i was a pup in the whole scheme of things but um listen you never want to i never want to leave you never want to leave any place because it's your family right it's even, the, you know, when I was in 117, to transfer out of there, those guys, you know, they're your family. But in the end, uh, which has always been said, you have to do what's best for you and what's best for your family. That's always the the line I've heard my whole career. You, you want to study? 
you know, yeah, you're in a great place. You could be working in rescue too, right? It doesn't matter. The busiest place on earth. You, you, why do you study? Because it's it might be best for myself and my family, right? That's always the line that that everybody uses, and that's the truth. So, um, after Richie passed away, you know, 2006, 2007 starts rolling around. I'm there a couple of years. I'm in the I've been in the truck for I don't know how many years. It's been about four years. So, you know, like anything too things get stale too, right? Like, you know, um, you have to always kind of push yourself too, right? I don't know if I could have stayed in one place for 25 years. So some guys do that. Listen, everything that's, there's a butt for every seat, right? It's, it's what you want right. out of the job. So I think around 2006, we moved, uh, we were having another kid, uh, my wa- we had a daughter in 2000. So think about this. My daughter was born September 21st, 2000. And now here's September 21st, 2001. Right. This is two weeks, three weeks after 9-11, two weeks after 9-11. And I have video at my daughter's first birthday party that we just watched not too long ago. And I watch myself in those videos and I ain't there. You know what I'm saying? This is my How daughter's first. This is my daughter's first birthday party. And I, I, you know, I had just been home probably for, I don't even remember, you know, I was down there for three days after 9-11 straight. And then I came home and then went back, you know, like, like we were all doing. But I think back, you know, to looking at myself in some of those videos, you know, with my daughter and then, you know, like anybody and everybody, you know, uh, you have a little bit of guilt, you have all this stuff after 9-11 and, uh, not the hops got you around, but I might have not been making the best decisions um, at that point. And uh, so that's why I have a space between my oldest, my oldest daughter, and my youngest daughter. So we had it. We finally she finally got pregnant again. 2000. I finally got my act together and it was probably like 2003, four ish. And she had a miscarriage and then took her, you know, after that, took her a year or so my wife to get, to get pregnant. We got pregnant again. And then, uh, was 2000. My daughter was born 2007. So I have, you know, six and change in between, right. Or whatever it is. It's like me and my and, sister. Yeah. So, but then at that point, uh, my oldest daughter was in public school in Whitestone and we kind of felt like we were going to have to make a move somewhere. Like, what are we going to do? Like going to high school and all these things. And then, you know, we start looking around and that's when, just kept moving north uh, to find, you know, better spot. The city was getting a little crappy. And so we moved up to Warwick in 2007. And my daughter was born here. Actually, she was born in June of 07. And we moved here September of 07, I remember. And then I was traveling. So it's 90, it was 90 miles to... I forget to the firehouse, some ridiculous number, Jeez. like two bridges, uh, two borough, three boroughs. Like, and I did that for one year, like full out one year. Like I said, I'm going to give it a try. I mean, I love the guys. It's my home. I don't want to bail. So I did it for one year traffic. I would do 25 runs, 30 runs, and then drive three hours home. <laughs> right. So I was just like, guys, I love you, but I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to wrap it up. And, uh, so again, I was probably looking to do something where I was going to, you know, move coops that have been chirping in my ear to come back to sock. You know, they wanted bosses there. So I'm like, all right, so maybe I'll come back. I wasn't thinking about 288. I was thinking about going up to the Bronx. It would cut my commute, you know, be one hour instead of three hours, one and a half hours, whatever it is. And, uh, so I called chief LaFamina and, um, He's like, absolutely. You have to go to the rescue school. So I think 2008, I went to the rescue school and, you know, you have to run the, the I was with Rex Morris, Cat Morris and um, uh, Brian Siegel and Tony DeMunda. And it was four, four of us. And uh, we ran the rescue school. We ran classes for, for everybody to come through the rescue school, new guys that were coming at the sock. And then I, by chance, uh, they had the list moving a little bit quicker, and I had to, you'd have to do a year there. 
And by the time 2009 rolled around, Mike Smithwick, who was a lieutenant in Squad 288, was getting promoted. And Coops called me up and said, hey, listen, you know, there's a bunch of guys, you know, Smithwick's getting promoted. There's a few guys um, that talk to the captain, but you should throw your hat in the ring. So then I was like, ah, great. Then I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know if I want to go back there and work there, you know, just as a boss type of thing. So I went home. I talked about it, thought about it. And uh, I called Cap Evans up. I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm interested in uh, throwing my hat in the ring, possibly uh, coming to, you know, be a lieutenant there, you know. No exaggeration. Like two days later, Chief Lafamina calls me up. He's like, you go on UFO to squad 288. And uh, that was it. I went there UFO, uh, which was like a covering spot. And mm -hmm. then literally like, I don't even remember when I got assigned, but it, was, it wasn't too much longer than that. So 2009, I got assigned as the boss and it was great. I had some guys that I knew from like when I left in 02, there were guys, new guys obviously coming in in January of 02, like November of 2001, there were new guys to come fill the spots that the guys we had lost. Yeah. So I knew them. I didn't know them well, but I knew them and that helped because there were a few guys that I was very close with John McCoy, uh, Steve Alardi, Ren Terry. There was a bunch of guys there that I could, you know, that made it easier transition. And, uh, you know, coming back into SOC, I got to go through the ropes again. I got to start learning about trench again. I have to start learning about, you know, all that stuff that I had, you know, you don't touch it, you lose it, you know, so. Right. And that, that was what I wanted to ask you about, actually. And you just touched on it. I'm glad you did. Is that you're coming in as lieutenant now. And you're already thinking as lieutenant in a conventional engine company. Now you're a lieutenant in a special operations company. Was there a significant mindset shift that not just you as a firefighter, but you as a fire officer? Um, I mean, I, I've seen what, you know, being there for four years as a fireman, I knew what, again, going back to what you said, the experiences that I had, I knew what I liked about the bosses, what they did uh, when I was a fireman there. So I kind of had an idea, a roadmap that of what I wanted to do and how I wanted to be there. Um, you know, obviously early on, I had to fall back on the guys because I wasn't up to speed on my ropes and stuff. I had to trust them to set up high points and do stuff. I mean, we had some crazy, you know, one of my first jobs coming back um, to 288, we had a job over by uh, 289, 138 and uh, 287, 136. It was like a two story. I don't even know what the heck it was, if it was a laundromat or whatever it was, but it was ripping and I, we were just pulling up and I heard over the radio, mayday, mayday, mayday. Like it was just like my, one of my first runs as a, as the boss. So, you know, throwing you right into the, into the mix, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. So we got right to the door. Uh, guys started piling out um, and we had everybody accounted for, thank God. But uh, you know, right, right out of the box, you're right in the mix, man. Everybody's, you know, it's right, right into it, right into the, to the boiling water. You know what I mean? So you have to learn fast. I, I enjoy that part. Uh, especially when I came back, I was, again, it was fresh. The guys were great. And again, I started finding that little sweet spot again, where I loved coming to work. There were young guys there that, you know, a couple of new guys that we had uh, just got in that were really gung ho about it. And by that time, within a couple of years, I love going to fires, but I got more. It's like when I take my nephew hunting, I love hunting, but my nephew shoots a deer or shoots something. It's like, I got it right. I love watching his excitement, right? It's, it's, it's as if I got it. So for me, if the guys went to work and I was able to get them a good piece of the job, right. If I could talk to chief into making me do something or do, you know, to me, that was, that was, uh, more, uh rewarding if that makes any sense to see those guys get involved and do stuff especially if they were you know four or five years on the job you know what i mean and and that was definitely what i looked towards more uh as i got older into into the career than uh you know i still love going to work but for me having those guys catch work and getting them a piece of a job was was what i was really looking forward to do for the most part
Absolutely. We'll continue more in a second because uh, I do want to touch on uh, set, definitely the Hurricane Sandy response and starting up the podcast, and then we'll get to the rapid fire because I don't want to keep you too long. But we can hear you fine. Your frame's a little messed up, so just briefly come back out and come back in. And uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get that straightened out. Of course, this is volume thirty nine of the best of the bravest. I'm going to go out. Yep, no problem. Uh, interviews with the FDNY's elite, and our guest tonight is Lieutenant. Louis Refrano, who is, of course, one fifth to get in salty experience. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Like I said, I'm kind of weary of doing a shout out, not because I don't want to, but because if I miss somebody, then I feel like crap about it. So uh, but I appreciate all you guys being here. And it's been a good conversation so far uh, with Lou, who's back now. Let's see if his frame is a little clearer. See if he pops up. Can't quite see him yet, but we'll uh, we'll work on that as we do. And uh, Sammy, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Lou still can't see you. So uh, let me see what the people are saying. So far, if I can bring anything up here, glad to see two of my favorites. Well, we certainly appreciate your support. And Darren, I know you got to run, Darren Phillips. Uh, hopefully, I can see you down the road, buddy, for the next show. My sister's here. My brother-in-law's here. Uh, let's see. Do we got Lou now? Not quite yet. There we go. All right, you're back, and you're clear. So I'll remove that other uh, portion there from the stream. So getting into 2012 with Hurricane Sandy, um, this is something that devastated the city as a whole, but Queens was particularly hard hit by it. And you weren't in 288 that night, as you were telling me, you were in the SOC task force. So as this storm is coming in and it was full throttle, it was such full throttle and it happened so fast. What was the response and what was the mission specifically of the task force? So I worked that day uh, when the storm hit and... We ended up, you know, we were running all over the place. But one of the runs that I remember was we went to Manhattan. Uh, one of the cranes on top of the building was like spinning around, like legitly, like, you know, swinging around like this. And they weren't sure what to do. Uh, they were trying to, I think Squad 18 was up there and Rescue 1 was up there already. But we went as like a support and they were going to try and lasso. I mean, it was just, it was crazy because the storm hadn't even really hit yet or was just yep. really starting. It was like, I don't know, about three or four o'clock in the afternoon when we went there, if I remember. And so we finally get out of there. Now I had been in the SOC task force. So the task force was set up. It's not like, um, uh, USAR kind of similar, but it was set up for New York, New Jersey, the, the, the closest States, Pennsylvania, right. Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So in case, there was something that, you know, especially New York, obviously, upstate New York, Buffalo. I think they went up there for the snows. They did, you know, there was, they had in Elmira, they had some uh, swift water stuff. They had flooding. So we had a, a cache of tools. And every two weeks or whatever, every two weeks, we would get the guys together. We would test all the tools. We had a huge cache of tools, all sorts of stuff. And uh, we had swift water boats, all this stuff. And it was a great it was a great job it was a great gig um i there was a lot of guys from sock in there and uh there was a, a two or three bosses i was one of them uh mike smithwick tony to captain tony tedeschi was another one so um they kind of ran it and then myself and a couple other guys were kind of like the, the filling guys so it was a great it was great uh you know to do that uh didn't hurt that it was sometimes on overtime so that was always a nice thing but um so that that night, what they were doing was we had set up and guys were getting paid. I, I was just going there that night. But that that day they had set up like swift water boat teams. Right. So they had like four in Rockaway spread out. Uh, and then they had a couple in Staten Island. I think they had a couple in the Bronx, you know, by City Island or something like that. But for the most part they knew Rockaway was going to get hit and Staten Island was going to get hit. So they sent these teams with a boat, uh, some tools. And I think they had three or four guys each. If I remember, I don't remember, but, and then I went to the headquarters, which is where we met, where all the tools used to be stashed. And we used to stay there um, just to keep an, monitoring what each place was in case they needed more tools. We had a couple of box trucks, uh, high water vehicles, actually, to bring them tools if they needed it right so it was myself probably like i don't know 10 guys we were at we were at the the headquarters it was in queens uh, long island city at the time so <clears throat> the storm starts to hit i get out of work at six o'clock uh 
I'm able to drive to Long Island City from Maspeth from, from 288. And I don't even know what time it was. I'll be lying. Seven, eight, nine o'clock. I don't know when the storm was hitting. It was dark. My wife calls me. Her, she has two brothers. One lived in Whitestone at the time. One lived in Rockaway. Um, and she calls me crying hysterical that her brother just called. And he had a brand new baby. He didn't evacuate. And the water is up to his chest in his house. Yeah. So oh I'm gosh. like, holy mackerel. I'm like, and and there was a problem with the, with the cell service too. It was very, very tough to talk to, you know, through the cells and everything. I don't know if that was with the storm or antennas. I don't remember. I don't know. So I knew what, where he lived and um, what block he lived on. So I hang up the phone, and now this is – it's probably like 8, 9 o'clock. And I go over to Mike Smithwick, the captain. I'm like, Mike, listen, my, my brother-in-law is in a bad spot, man. I'm going to take the truck. I'm going to maybe take a couple of guys. I'm going to take – we had boats on there already. I'm going to said, I'm just going to grab a few guys and see if I can get down there. He's like, go. So that, that's probably like – right now, if you were if you drove there – from Long Island City to to Rockaway probably take you forty five minutes to an hour in in a perfect world, possibly even with no traffic, right? <laughs> so you, you you know where this is going, right? So I go over to the guys. I say, who wants who wants to come in? I don't even remember if there was ten guys there. They all like this. I'm in. So now we load all these guys. I think two guys stayed back, Mike and somebody else. I load all these guys into the into the truck. And we start heading out. I think we actually took two vehicles. So one was going to go one way, one was going to go another way because we were hearing that at Howard Beach, the roads were washed out, and Mill uh, Mill Basin, all the road, all the bridges were everything was washed out. So we f we figured we'd take like a two prong thing. <sighs> it's just thinking about it is like it was so exhausting. So we just start driving, and we're in touch with them, and they're. They have to stop and then they're trying to go back around a different way. Then we go there to a different spot. We're trying to get across the bridge because it's a peninsula. Long uh, uh, Rockaway, if you don't know it, it's just like a peninsula off of uh, off of Queens. So there's two bridges that kind of go across the uh, the bay, but the roads were all too deep. So now it's 10 o'clock. I'm calling my wife. I can't get a hold of her. It's 11 o'clock. Now it's 12 o'clock. There's fires in Rockaway, as you know, right? I mean, the fires were absolutely insane. We could see the fires from Howard Beach, and we could see the fires. That's how there was, you know, 20 buildings going in one spot, 10 buildings going in another spot. It was crazy. So we finally, it's like, I don't even know what time it was, 12, 1 o'clock. We finally are able to get across in a spot, and we're at, he's on 110th Street. Where we get across the bridge is like 160th Street. So we start going down the main street. It's probably a couple of feet of water. All right, we have the boat ready to go. It's it's in the back. We're we're going. All of a sudden, people are screaming, "Help! Help! Help!" Over here! Holy mackerel! There's people. There's kids. There's this. That we get out. We bring them. Get the boat. We bring them back down to because the, where the road was in the back was was low water. So we bring them over there. They come back. We get in the truck. We start going. We're at 140th Street. Help, help, help. Over here. There's people up here. There's an old guy here. You know, this guy. We get him. Now it's 2 o'clock in the morning. We bring him back. I'm trying to get there, obviously, but I cannot. People are in dire straits here, right? It's blowing 50 miles an hour, 60, 70 miles an hour, whatever the heck it was blowing. The water is up to, you know, your waist. And we start going. The water's getting, again, it's getting deeper. We get to like 100. 20 something street and there's like a freaking convent or something there's people hanging out of every window it's mayhem right so i tell the guys i uh, listen you guys stay here do you do what you have to do i'm only 10 blocks up i'm just gonna walk up and see if i can get to the house right i had a we, we all had like a wetsuit on i had a wetsuit you know up to here it was you know the whole thing i had a huge wetsuit on i had a flotation vest on and I start walking and the water is probably, you know, a little bit above my waist. Right. And I'm walking. And as I'm walking, there's a building, three buildings on fire on by 116th Street that they're just 
on fire. There's an engine, a fire truck with the stang that's operating, but there's nobody there. It's just they put the stang up. That you couldn't even see the hydrant. The hydrant was underwater. I walked over to it just to see where if it was actually, you know, where where the hydrant was that it was pumping from. And so the rig was like the tires were almost underwater, but it was still shooting water onto these three buildings that were on fire. There was wood. It was like an apocalypse. It was like like something from like Escape from New York back in the day. It was like, like wood was floating by me on fire. Like it was hilarious. You know what I mean? Like, so I start walking a little further. I'm on 116th. He's on 110th. As I'm walking, I'm grabbing onto like the fences of the buildings so that I could see where the where the uh, sewers are. The water is like doing one of these, like a like a vortex, like like. <laughs> going down into the i'm like i don't even know what the hell's going on it was like it's a scene out of so i was actually going to go to the beach to go around but i ended up staying on the sidewalk and just followed the fence line pretty much up to here you know now it's like four o'clock in the morning five o'clock in the morning whatever it's starting i could see like a glimmer like it's starting to get light out this is the best part i get to 110th street and i could see his house and the water is down now over there to like, I don't know, the steps, you know? Right. So I not bang on the door, bang on the door. Nobody's answering, bang on the door. Nobody's answering. I call my wife. I have the phone in my thing. I pick up the phone. I was going to break the door down. I, I call her up. She picks up the phone. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? I'm here. I'm at 110. Where, what's going on? Where did you talk to him? She's like, yeah, I spoke to him like two hours ago. They got up in the attic. They're, they're sleeping in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you are you freaking kidding me like to this day i still break his balls i'm like like i he said he, he got so mad at me he's like you risked your life to come all the way over there i'm like you idiot i spent from eight o'clock <laughs> until almost i spent 12 hours like almost 12 hours traveling across the borough to come help you the best i could help you you know what i mean and uh you know to this day i still i still break his balls about that so understandably was, yeah 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 no pretty interesting night man and we stayed oh, there sure. for you know i mean it was it was crazy i'm sure i remember that time period at the time uh i don't live too far from the water i'm not by an ocean but we have a lake nearby and some so in that area it can get pretty bad with the flooding and my great grandfather was living around the corner at the time from where i live now and he came with us for safety purposes we used to have a real big tree out in the front yard and i just remember i didn't sleep a lick that night i came down to the living room to sleep you know, out of concern for that tree toppling over my whole the whole night, Lou. I was looking at that tree. I was like, yeah, "Stay there, stay yeah, there." Yeah, no doubt. That was a uh, that was a crazy storm. That was definitely a crazy storm, and it took no a doubt. while for the tri-state to recover from that. So, I guess that brings us into 2019. Now, you had started getting salty as an apparel company five years prior. Kevin had went out on an injury and retired. Ultimately, you're still on the job. You went out on an injury in 2019, and the apparel company's still going strong. But that year, 2019, is when you stay involved in the fire service from the standpoint of you stop hopping on the rig, that ends, and that's bittersweet. But now the podcast comes into play. And Kevin mentioned when he was on last year that he broached that idea to you. And what was the moment? Because, listen, it's not an easy sell. Even if you have somebody to help you, podcasting is not easy. It's, it's a lot of work that goes into it. It's definitely a labor of love, emphasis on both love and labor. What ultimately convinced you that this was a good idea to do? Well, I, I was originally, I was the one who brought him the shirt idea in 2014. So when he brought me the idea in 2019, Kevin still works out. He's still crazy with that. Uh, mm -hmm. We worked out our whole lives together. Uh, after my injury, I kind of, that was it. I couldn't really, I don't really like working out like that with weights anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, when he first came, what he does is he was watching weightlifting podcasts, right? And I don't, I mean, he, he follows what's going on now, but he enjoys the Arnold Schwarzenegger times, right? He enjoys like the seventies and eighties, like when those guys, so he started watching podcasts, I guess about the history of weightlifting, right? Mm -hmm. So when he first approached me, he's like, we got to do a podcast. We got to get some old guys on and talk about it, you know? So I'm like, get the hell out of here. There is no, I just retired. I have somewhat decent career. I, I, the last thing I want to do is be that guy, right? I don't want to, you know, like some schnook on, which we still are schnooks, but, you know, <laughs> the last thing I want to be is another, you know, big schnook, you know? So uh, it kind of went away. And then within a month, he called me again and he ended up talking with, uh, he had Pete 
uh, gave me a call. They did like a, we did a Zoom, and they kind of told me how they thought it was going to go. And before we did the podcast, Kevin did by himself. If you watch it, he did a spotlight on Squad Two Eighty Eight, mm-hmm. and Pete put it together. And I watched it, and that was the thing that made me that that it was. I liked the way it was. That was done, you know. Um, and then we started putting a list together, him and I, of who we could get. Uh, and you know, hey, listen, Hank was one of the first guys. A um, um, couple of uh, Ray Sealy, and those guys helped. It's not an easy thing to to do this. Uh, they have to trust, right? They don't want to be that guy on the, on the podcast either, especially something that's brand new, but those guys trusted us and, um, they set the bar. And as we started to get a little bit of traction and people watched it and obviously we're a hundred percent, uh, truthful, right. To the most, for the, for the most part, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, we can't say everything, you know, probably, you know. The stories I've told you, there's probably 99 of them that I can't tell you. Yeah. But so those guys were were the ones who stepped up. And because they did, it made it easier for other guys to step up. And we gained some traction that in that way. And, you know, then we started rolling. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoy talking to guys. I enjoy, again, the nostalgia. I enjoy the history of that, the you know, the stories are great. Obviously I love going to reunions and listening to the old guys and, and, you know, my face hurts. And that's, that's where I got that from is because when I used to go to reunions, I used to say, my face is freaking killing me because I'm laughing so much from, and you can't believe this stuff. And then chief Lafamina was one that came on. And and I think when he came on and Bobby Galeon came on, that was the two that really solidified that for us that, you know, it's, we're full of respect, obviously we'll break your balls, but it's out of love for, for, for that person, the, the FDNY obviously, and you know, the fire service as a whole. I mean, if you would have asked me if I thought where we would be now, if I would say, you know, no way. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of people watch it, which, <laughs> you know, I enjoy yeah. that. And, you know, I see guys at the shows and all that stuff and I break balls, you know, we break balls about the emails and stuff like that. But I, that I love, you know, if you have a legit email and you send me an email about, you know, enjoying the show and what something that you learned and all that stuff that's priceless to, to, to me, especially, you know, so mm-hmm. that part I enjoy. I do, And it keeps me close to the job. Like you said, right. It's uh, it's easy peasy for me. So. Oh, you still, you're still able to stay involved and it's, it's not just to reach locally within the FDNY. It's not just to reach nationally with, with, you know, members of the fire service from around the country that you've profiled. It's an international reach. That's yeah, crazy. Everyone from around the world, Europe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't wouldn't agree with the schnooks part, but you know, listen, <laughs> you, you've done all right for yourselves in that. Listen, you know, like I said, everywhere, people from every part of the globe, Australia, Europe, you name it, they're engaged with it. They're listening actively. Maybe different time zones, but the love for the show is still the same. You look on the audio side; it's over a, a couple million downloads, and it's a great yeah, thing to crazy. be a part of. You know, now there's five of us: there's you and and Coobs and myself and Gons, who's in the chat, and Tank. And man, I sometimes I find myself saying, "Wow, I'm, I'm a part of this, a small part, but it's fine." But you even fun. think about that. Just the fact, I mean, we we use the the friendships that we've made from this, right? Yes. You like you just said yourself, Gonzo, uh, Jose, Tank. Like those guys came to when I went down to Florida. They came down there. They stayed with me. You know, it was great. I enjoy uh, I enjoy that part. You know, that's it's priceless, right? Where are you, where are you gonna? You know, you're making lifelong friends. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, Kevin is, uh, he's relentless. You know what I mean? I have to rein him in on a lot of things, but he really is, uh, he really is relentless and, um, it's good because sometimes I don't feel like that, you know, 100%, but he's always there. And then that, you know, reaffirms it for me. And, you know, I was talking to my wife just the other day about this. It's like, almost like, this might be something down the road where, you know, maybe they'll remember me for this, you know what I mean? And, and, and us for this, all of us for, you know, spreading the word and hopefully, uh, you know, people feel like the fire service might be going a little sideways or whatever. So I think it's important for us to, again, show the young guys who may not be getting, uh, looking where the history is coming from. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, we go back to that same thing, the tradition, right. 
The same thing that I do in the firehouse, showing the wall with the mark on the wall. It's important for guys to know where we came from and what guys we're dealing with. You know, now that you have your hood and you have your turnout gear and you have every, you know, flashlight and everything, you know, the best rig with air conditioning and, you know, whatever it is, what those guys were dealing with in every city, not just the FDNY in, in, in Detroit and Baltimore. And they're still doing that stuff today. So I think it's important to that. That's important. I think that's the point that I think we try and get across is we're not saying, you know, to drink in the firehouse because that's what they did you know, allegedly back then, we're not saying to have a cheater, you know, because that's what they did. We're not saying that. We're not saying that to wear your mask because we didn't. We're not saying that. We're saying this is where it is so that you could learn from that um, and how things, you know, were so that you can be better. Right. Mm -hmm. And have more pride. Have some pride. God damn it. You know, have some pride. Take it. Take it for, for what it's worth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I think that's yeah. important. Of course, don't just get on the job, get into it, as you and Coobs often say. And, you know, last thing before I get to the rapid fire, I love how the five of us work. I really do. I think we mesh relatively well with each other, really well with each other. Obviously, you and Coobs do the work going around the country to these different trade shows, doing the work with the show, booking guests and su submitting ideas back and forth. You got Gons as a producer. You got Tank that's running the TikTok. You got me with the LinkedIn and the voiceovers. It's, it's really, I liken it to a good functioning basketball team. Point guard, small forward, shooting guard, power forward, center. That's how we operate. And again, it's I can't thank you enough for letting me be a part of it. I've, I've really had a lot of fun. Really, had no, fun. we love it. Yeah, Coops and great. I talk about it all the time. We love mm -hmm. it. Yeah, we it's, love you guys. Yeah, right back at you, brother. And on that note, I just can can't look it. at that picture. I can't look at the picture anymore. Though. You know, like, <laughs> me in the Rangers jersey. <laughs> I didn't. I, I every time. <laughs> I couldn't. There, it was there was one that was worse because it was me in the suit. And oh, that was no, that, not the first one you had there with the, uh -huh. you know, I don't know what the hell you were doing on that. Yeah, I was, I was airbrushed there. It was yeah, yeah, airbrushed. No good. Pretty, no boy, pretty no. much for a little context for the no, audience. How many times you got to tell you fake is no good? You know, exactly. What I mean? No airbrushing. Exactly. Because <laughs> I played that commercial, a little context before the rapid fire for the audience. Uh, there was a different draft of the consulting company commercial. And I said, hey, can you guys take a look at this? I made it real quick. It's like 45 seconds. I kid you not because I can see everybody's faces. When I saw Gans's face, and particularly Lou's face, when the picture of me in the suit came up, this is Lou's head. I just see his mouth <laughs> go wide open, and he's cracking up, and he's holding his stomach after the uh, commercial's done. So, you know, listen, even something like that, a little feedback like that goes a long way. But, I mean, listen, uh, the Rangers jersey, as you said last night in the show, I was able to catch no, it. No, I'm glad you're a Ranger fan, at least. It could be worse, right? Listen, it could you're be worse. an Islander fan, I'll tell you. Fan, or a, de a Devil fan, you know? Oh. <laughs> and uh, this from Jay before the uh, rabbit fire. He's watching across the pond, as he mentioned. As you know, Mike, I'm across the pond. I grew up watching the FDNY on TV. Lou and Coop's doing the podcast. I've spoken to guys who I grew up watching. Brought me as close to the job as I'll ever get. I appreciate you guys. And we appreciate you, Jay, for not your just your support of this program, but also getting salty as a whole. So now it is the rabbit fire. Five hit and run questions from me. Uh -oh. Five hit and run answers from you. You can say pass if you want. Are you ready? I could say pass? You can say pass if you want, if you oh, don't really? have any. So there you go. It's a little Pass. bit of an out in there. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. So the first question, you worked during three different decades, 90s, 2000s, and of course the 2010s. Favorite decade of your career, favorite decade to work in the FDNY? Hmm. I would say 90s, only because I was able to use the boots for a couple of years <laughs> before I got the bunker gear. It was pretty cool. I still yeah. think back, I'm like, how the hell did I run into Burnham Billings with those things? But there at least go. I could say I did it. Not for, not for long, but a, a couple of years, I think three years. Two years, two years, three years. Uh, well, he started in '93. I think the bunker gear was what '94 after Watch Street, so about a year or two. Yeah, but it, you know they still had to get it out. So I don't right, remember right, if we right. got it all. You know, it wasn't like they just everybody got it. Exactly. I don't know if they did it by borough, but probably yeah, at least sense. two years. Yeah, yeah that was cool. Second, of course, favorite type of rig to ride on. You had the Mac originally in 288. You, I'm sure you rode on some Pierces. What do you prefer? One that runs. I was never a rig guy. <laughs> if it got me to the fire fast, I would say the Macs probably because they were quicker. I had the Mac in. Uh, we had a spare in one seventeen because we had the ninety foot ninety five foot towel ladder. Mm -hmm. I don't know what what to make. I think that was a Mac. Um, yeah, but it was it was a pig. But we used to get this the uh, a spare 
Mm-hmm. like from the 80s a mac and that thing that was the one i used to tell you used to bellow out the black smoke like it was like <laughs> all you would see is teeth i would tell him yeah i would tell the guy roll you in there he's like what i'm like roll you in there up he's like what i'm like forget it it's like next thing you know you just see teeth i'm like dude i mean he would be pitch black in the car i mean yeah. pitch black yeah oh my goodness third and this is why i say you could say pass in the event it can't be told on the air funniest call you ever responded to oh dude I mean, I mean, I have one that just popped right into my head. I don't know if I've ever told that story, but it's a little. We got called for a burned victim. I was in 290 and uh, we get there. I don't even know if you've ever heard this story. So we get there, knock on the door. It's in the projects. I knock on the door. The girl peeks out. I'm like, hey, is everything all right? We got called. Somebody got burned. So she's like, yeah, I'm burned. I'm like, all right. So you got let me in. She's like, I'm embarrassed. I'm like, listen, just let me in. Let me come in there. So I come in there. She closes, kind of closes the door. I step around. She's behind the door. And she's got her boob like out the top. She's a heavy girl. And it, her boob is out. And it's like, it's like this big, like this big. Jeez. Right. <laughs> and she's got toothpaste all over it because <laughs> she, she burned herself with the curling iron. Uh, like she, I guess yeah. she picked her, she was on the phone and she was doing curls or something that she burned herself. So she had toothpaste all over the place. So I don't want to get into too much, but that, that was, that turned out to be a very, very funny uh, run. We ended up wrapping it up and, you know, the EMS got there and they were like, what the hell you got? We had it like around their head and everything. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I um, can imagine. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 Fourth, a lot of the guys in uh, in sock would get detailed. Of course, you're housed with hazmat, so that doesn't count. I know you got detailed there a lot, probably. But besides hazmat, of course, whenever rescue you two. Would... Okay, there you go. <laughs> that answers that question. Besides rescue two, uh, well, when I became a boss, if I worked, if I worked uh, outside of my firehouse, I used to love to work. I used to work at two fifty five, one fifty seven in Flatbush, mm-hmm. and uh, I had a string there, like four or five tours in a row that i worked there i had jobs every time i went there so there you go. 255 157 when i was a boss but um i worked there a few times as a boss in rescue too but I, I remember working there more than uh a few times than uh when i was a fireman there too so not a bad place to work and oh my place, goodness yeah great well a great house with great history last question of course if you can grab us brand spanking new firefighter of the FDNY that just graduated from the rock and he or she's about to start their career. Knowing everything you know from across your 26 years of experience as a fireman and certainly a fire officer, what advice would you give a young guy or gal coming on the job now? Oof, uh, that's a tough one, Mike. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. To be honest with you, I'm not. I have some old thoughts. I don't know if it's always, you know, good. Um, I mean, as far as you have to drill all the time, right? You always have to be, you have to be working all the time. Um, and to me, if, if you want to go to work, you'll find it, even if you don't have any hooks, like obviously people get on the job and they have hooks, they're going to find, they're going to get to the, you know, the best places, the good places. But if you don't have hooks, it's not easy to do, but if you do the work and you do the drilling and you do all that stuff and you stay vil- uh, vigilant, you're going to, you're going to find the work. You'll, you'll chase the work. You know what I mean? So, you know, stay, stay on that. Don't, don't get discouraged just because you're, you're not in that spot right now because it's a long career. But I would say, you know, constantly keep pushing yourself. And, um, you know, as far as the job nowadays, you know, I always say like uh, there's been a few guys on, you know, try and handle everything in the firehouse. You know what I mean? I think years ago that was that was not even a thought to go outside the firehouse. But now it seems like that's like the first thing that guys do is possibly run outside the firehouse or call the chief or something. So I would say the best bet is to, uh, you know, try and handle what you can handle in the firehouse before you get to that point. But I don't know if that's good advice anymore. You know, the way things are, I don't know. Some of the old school traditions are still in place, and sometimes old school is the best. I'm a nostalgic guy too, so if it's if it's something that's not egregious and not overwhelmingly serious, where someone from the outside would have to get involved, I think that's the way to go, and that's good advice. So this has been a lot of fun. Stick around. We'll say goodbye off the air before I say goodbye to the audience. Any shout outs you want to give? No, Mike. It's always a pleasure. You finally got me. I enjoyed it. 
it's uh i remembered some stories that i hadn't thought about to be honest with you you, you said something that made me think of it the boob story and a couple other ones so it was pretty good <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun it was good getting you we joked about it for a long time and finally you were here and I, I kid you not i was telling this to my mother earlier we were running errands throughout the day i said you know i got a lot of different bosses of course now on my gig at the firehouse and they're great and i love working for those guys and i joke I said to my mom i'm like you're my main boss i says i'll exclude you from this listing but uh, all, out of, all, out of all the bosses I got, I really do enjoy working for you and Coops. You're easy bosses to work for. So uh, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, uh, I wasn't in a good place at the beginning of the year. We know why. But, you know, you, you, you pulled me out of that uh, trench, and I appreciate it. You know, and things are thriving now, and it's great good to get you, you Good things to good people. That's what yeah. I say. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So, like I said, stick around. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Coming up next on the Mike New Haven podcast, there'll be no shows the majority of July. I'll be away. I'm going to come back with a big, big guest for July 25th. That'll be the next show. I'll be on vacation for a little bit. So you'll get a best of. You'll get some clips and some highlights from the shows that we've done throughout June. Then we get back again with new episodes July 25th. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. I can't wait to share more once we get closer to 25th because I've been working on that particular guest for about five years now. And finally, that person will be here. So uh that'll be a great show when we get back but in the meantime enjoy your july i'll see you the 25th and on behalf of retired fny lieutenant lewis Befrano, i'm mike cologne and we will see you next time take care, everyone and have a great weekend and a great rest of your night take care be safe Can I Thank you.